What's happening guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another video. And with Chelsea having no game until the 1st of October, there's very little to talk about with on the pitch matters, but there's plenty to talk about off the pitch. And Chelsea's search for a new sporting director seems to be heating up a little bit. RB Salzburg, Christoph Freund seems to be at the top of the list. And according to multiple sources, talks seem to be very advanced and an appointment could be coming fairly soon. And there's no better guy to get on to discuss this than Mr. Euro expert himself, Alex. Mate, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Um, Chelsea looking for in a new sporting director. They're looking for not really a big name. Potter, Graham Potter's going to have a say in it. But I think the key thing that Bowley and Clearlake have really hammered home since they've come over is they've got to be strong in data and scouting. Um, does Christoph Freund from RB Salzburg, does he tick those boxes? Would he be the sort of guy that would make a good sporting director at Chelsea? Oh, I'll leave the last question for probably later on. But in terms of the data, I I think, yes. I mean, Christoph Freund, um, he's a very interesting uh, sporting director in that in the fact that, uh, I mean, like many, their route into the position isn't very traditional. But I think most ones you see at top level clubs, respected clubs like Salzburg, they've made their way up the pyramid, right? Now, Freund was an ex-Austrian footballer um, and he joined Salzburg in 2006 as a team manager, he started just by doing compiling reports on opposition through data and tactical analysis. Then in 2012, when Ralph Rangnick came in, he became sporting coordinator. I think that was a bit more legal stuff. And then it's only been 2015 when he was made sporting director of um, RB Salzburg. And yeah, he's definitely on this sort of new wave of data uh, recruitment. But I think he might surprise some people because... He, I mean, I've gone through quite a lot of his stuff. I've read a book, actually. I think it's a good shout out to say to Karen Tejuani, who's written this book on our, on the RB Empire. And I've been looking for some of these interviews that he relies. He's got a very well set up system, but he's only got seven full time scouts that he has said himself. And they just know exactly what they want, like 16 to 20 year olds that it's almost like a blueprint, a very defined blueprint. We've not seen him be like a sporting director for Liverpool, where one week he could be going for Virgil van Dijk, the next he could be going for Thiago in that sort of sense, or rather one transfer window to another. Um, it's a very interesting background he's come from. It's a very interesting way he's run the club. Yeah, I mean, and obviously Chelsea looking for that new sporting director. Um, Michael Edwards, obviously the former Liverpool director, Chelsea were desperate to try and get him, but couldn't really convince him. He didn't want to come back into the game so soon. Um, so that's unfortunate. Paul Mitchell, another one at Monaco, who's obviously got a very good reputation. But I think Christoph Freund seems to be kind of at the top of the list. But out of those guys kind of mentioned, you know, Freund, um, obviously Paul Mitchell, there was talk of Lewis Campos as well, even though he's just gone to PSG. I think that's more kind of, I don't think there's really too much to that. And there's also another one on the list, Tim Steiton, I think, at Bayer Leverkusen as well. I mean, out of those kind of names that I mentioned, is, is Freund's kind of the standout guy? Oh. Or is that, or is he not really? <laughs> I wouldn't say he is, no. Um, I think compared to people like Paul Mitchell and Luis Campos, he's actually got, a, he's got to prove quite a bit. I mean, we it's worth touching on the fact that get the good out of the way, especially. I went through his recruitment since 2015 and there's only really a couple of transfers you could argue that are bad. In his first window, he brought in a Brazilian called Paolo Miranda. For At the time, it was the most expensive fee in the window, 2.4 million for Salzburg. Just went back to Brazil quite shortly after. But mm. some of the players, I mean, we tend to think of Salzburg as this empire of young stars. But when you really go through it, it's incredible who he signed or who he's authorised a signing of, maybe it's a better way of saying it, since 2015. I mean, Deo Upamakano for under 2 million, yeah. Stefan Lina, who's in the Bundesliga, uh, Bernardo, who's went to Brighton, he now is back at Salzburg, Munoz Tabur, who's at Hoffenheim. Uh, these are all, like, under a million. Amadou Haidara, linked to United, under a million. Patson Daka from Zambia, under 0.5 million. Same for Enoch Mwepu, who was signed at the same time. Adi Emi and Haaland in the same window for under 20 million combined. Uh, Noah Okafor, who's starting to really come out of his shell now. Recent uh, Premier League debutants in Brendan Aronson and Rasmus Christensen. Uh, there's a lot of players he's managed to get for cut price fees who now we know the names of. Um, but the question I think really is that if you were to compare him to a Luis Campos, who I happen to know quite a bit about, he's, he owns his own sort of, I think, his own software, his own company who make 
a scouting software and data. And he's like, he, he's more of like a Ralph Rangnick figure, right? Uh, the player that, the, the man that um, Freund replaced, someone who really created his own vision. I think it's fair to argue that Freund has really, he's been gifted uh, a very stable base. I mean, he's always said he's very happy there. I remember Jesse Marshall as well, when he worked at um, Salzburg, saying this is the easiest job I've ever had because... <laughs> Everyone, everyone's on the same page. Everyone knows what they're doing. So it's a big question to say, can Christian Freund come into Chelsea and straight away operate as easily as uh, uh, Lewis Campos probably would? Yeah, no, I think it's a fair point. Obviously, Freund probably hasn't got the experience of working at a kind of a big club. It would be, it would be obviously a lot more people involved. It'd be very different kind of scale of an operation. Chelsea, I mean, Chelsea's recruitment, I think... Well, this summer I think it's been pretty decent, but generally over the years, Chelsea's recruitment's been pretty poor in terms of the in terms of the amount of money spent com- compared to how successful the signings have actually been. When was the last time you know Chelsea picked out kind of sort of a rough diamond from some, you know, some lower league in Europe or or kind of a relatively unknown 17, 18 year old and developed them into a top player? It, it doesn't it doesn't really happen. So you look at the guy the names that are reeled off, you know, and you think, well, wow, this is quite appealing, but then. Would those guys get the same opportunity? Say, you know, you found a Sesco at che- like Young um, at Chelsea. Say you found an Adi Amy, found a Haaland, etc. Are those guys going to get the same opportunity at Chelsea where the pressure is much, much larger than, say, when you know you're the best team in the Austrian Bundesliga and you can just play these guys? Are you, you're not really afforded the same opportunity at Chelsea to kind of do that because you've got to try and get results as soon as possible. I mean, do you see that? that kind of changing can you see potentially you know Chelsea kind of if Freund does get appointed that they can they'll go down that route and actually if they find these young players and discover them that they'll actually get an opportunity I don't think you can straight away I mean no. I guess the best example you could do of that is I think a good well, the way you were talking Charlie I think the, per, the team that comes to mind is Bayern Munich a team mm. where they are a giant and they don't have to buy first team players all the time because they've already got a great crop first team players. So they they can focus on pay, buying players like Matthias Tell yeah. uh, recently or Teo Hernandez when he was twenty three at Atletico. Like still sort of unproven players, but it's going to be nothing like what Christoph Freund has had at Salzburg. He can't come to Chelsea and bring up his uh, consultancy in, in Africa where he gets most of the African talent. And say, look, let's, you know, who have we got this Chelsea level? The answer is probably likely going to be absolutely no one because mm. Chelsea are going to be challenged for the top six. Like he, he'll he need to dial up from the 16 to 20 age group that he targets. I think maybe the most interesting thing we could say that Freund might bring over is that I think he's quite, um, he's, he's quite nailed on to trying to avoid actually bringing in too much foreign talent. I mean, he's, he's quite high on sort of, Bedding players incorrectly. Whenever a Salzburg player is signed, straight away they're assigned a German language teacher, and they're assigned someone to help them settle into the uh, settle into Salzburg and, and the neighbouring city. And he, I think the Salzburg model was thirteen to seventeen years old. They only buy players from the local region. I think like a, a couple of years after, it's from the country in Bavaria, and then it's only when it's like over nineteen years old they start looking maybe even outside of. Europe. So what you might see if Christoph Rang comes to Chelsea is him targeting players who are either English speaking or already in the Premier League and looking closer to home, which for some people they might really like that, having a bit more I think it's goes without saying English players in an English club it does harbour quite a nice identity mm. at times. Yeah, no, it definitely does. I mean, you've already seen like o- over the summer, Chelsea not only in heavily investing in the first team, but also for the future as well. The likes of Slanina from Chicago, Father, young goalkeeper, uh, Kassadai, the young midfield player from Inter Milan, Chukwameka from Aston Villa, um, you know, Omari Hutchinson from Arsenal and whatnot. Um, so there, there is, there is a, they are, they are kind of building for the future as well. They're not Chelsea are prepared to sign the best young players in Europe, but obviously the, the difference would be that kind of in a Salzburg, those guys would go straight into the first team, whereas at Chelsea. Like you might spend, 50, like in the case of Triple Maker, 10, 15 million pounds. For he might never make an appearance for you. And he, he and he, and he might not, and like he's not even played this season. And yet you think it's mad to have someone that's 15 million quid playing in a, in a 23s or a PL2. So you've got, you've got, I suppose you've got to find that, that right mix. But like, just once around out, like how important as well do you think it is? Because Graham Potter is going to have a, a, a relative say in, in who the next guy is going to be as well. I mean, 
what, what's his kind of track record with recruitment? I know he's, he's brought his guy over with him from Brighton, his recruitment uh, guy. Um, you know, and Brighton have recruited very well, the likes of uh, Caicedo, um, Kukurea in the past as well, brought, brought in for cheap money. Even Robert Sanchez has turned into one of the best goalkeepers in the Premier League. He came over from Spain for, for very little money. No one really knew much about him. So they've got a good eye at Brighton. And with that guy coming in as well, I mean, do you think with him and potentially Freund that we could be for heading up a, a pretty good recruitment department for windows to come? Uh, they could be, yes. But I think he, I'm happy you brought up Potter because I think an interesting point to touch on that's often for, forgotten about sporting directors. We talk about the recruitment. What we often forget to talk about is recruitment of managers, which is what they mm. have basically direct say over. And, I think it's worth looking at it, the parallels between um, the coaches that have come to Salzburg under uh, his reign. I think the first one was Oscar Garcia. He moved from Watford and went to RB, enjoyed great success as always. Went to San Etienne, Olympiacos, Celta and Reims in France, all within a short space of time. He kind of struggled to get going once he left RB. Same with Marco Rosa. Uh, now he moved from Salzburg to Dortmund and then uh, to Gladbach, sorry, and then to Dortmund. You know, he started well at Gladbach, it kind of tailed off, tailed off very quickly at Dortmund as well. And now he's at Leipzig, sort of struggling to get going again. Again, Jesse Marsh uh, moved mm. to Leipzig from Salzburg, struggled to get going uh, as well. And now we're at Matthias Yassel, who's the current manager, looks good. We'll see where he goes. But I think it's interesting that every manager has come in. Well, I think most people would agree they're all quite good, but above average coaches. They all struggled after leaving RB. And I think it's more about the coaches adapting to the team rather than the team adapting to them as RB have a very specific blueprint. So my point is, if Freud comes into Chelsea, I think you have to change tactic from let's build a style through our recruitment and build for the future when Potter leaves. I think if the owners are going to back themselves up properly this time and say we're backing Potter to the hills, then Freud's going to have to change tactic and build buy players that will work with Gray and Potter. It's, it, there's so many different things that are going to change if he moves to Chelsea from Salzburg. And I think that's why, like, you asked at the start, how do I feel about him going to Chelsea sporting director? I wouldn't be that confident. If he spent a long time there, maybe he will be able to implement the things that uh, he's had. But it's worth saying as well, so I want to mention that even the academy that's churning out great players at Salzburg, that was built the year before he became sporting director. He surely had a hand in it, of course, but it, it very much feels like he's a, a little unproven for the for the position he's in, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, just want to say lastly, is it? do you find it strange that because that uh, manager's been appointed first before a sporting director? Because normally you have a sporting director in place and then they, along with the owners, kind of help choose a new manager. It's, it's, I mean, is it? It's, I think it's quite unusual to have it the other way around because normally you get that structure in place and then you help pick a manager that's going to work well with a sporting director rather than the other way around. I mean, do you think there's anything to worry about in that sense or is just kind of, it's just the way it is at the moment? No, I think it, I think it is weird. Um, I mean, I think, that, I, I don't think that's down to a strategy from the owners. I think that is the owners kind of flailing around with the tuckle sacking. I mean, we, we and you spoke about my opinion very clear. I think, you don't sell Billy Gilmore to Brighton and then, you know, sign Graham Potter a week later if you've got a very good long-term strategy yeah. that you're back into the hill. So, yeah, I think the owners are still learning on the job quite clearly. And that, that is not a thing you would generally see around New York. A great example is um in uh, Monaco, um they had a, a coach called Roberto Moreno uh, he was a former Spanish coach. This is in 2020. And he'd been brought in and he was doing quite well. And then in the summer, um, Paul Mitchell, funnily enough, arrived. And as soon as he arrived, Roberto Moreno was sacked. And that and Paul Mitchell was sports director. So that's an example of manager coming in first, sports director coming in and immediately saying, nope, off, we're starting something yeah. new. Whereas you definitely cannot see that happening with Chelsea. It's very much going to be the manager has come first, he's going to have the power. And the sporting directors are going to have to come in and slowly build up the power base for themselves. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it's definitely exciting times. You know, Chelsea, you know, recruitment needs to change. You need, need a good structure in place above the manager. Pot has been backed big time, five year contract, 12 million a season. Like Chelsea don't offer big contracts to managers in terms of that length. Normally, it's very much 18 months. Everything seems to be in place for Potter to be here in the, for the long term. But again, 
patience is not something that owners have had at Chelsea. Maybe these new owners, it, 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 it could be different. But yeah, it remains to be seen kind of what happens and how that goes. Hopefully a new director will be in place kind of around before the World Cup starts. Hopefully you can start working towards that January transfer window where there's going to be money to spend. But it's, yeah, it's definitely exciting. And we're going to look forward to see how that works. So well, Alex, mate, thanks so much for joining me. Really appreciate your thoughts and your insight. Guys, make sure you check out all of Alex's stuff across all social media platforms. I've linked them in the description below. So go and check them out. Some great content on there. Please do smash the likes on this video and please do subscribe to the channel as well if you haven't done so already.